from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2006 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Potent Biology, Stem Cells, Cloning, and Regeneration, will be given by Dr. Douglas Melton, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Harvard University, and Dr. Nadia Rosenthal, senior scientist at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. The fourth lecture is titled, Stem Cells and the End of Aging. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Cech. Welcome to the final presentation in this year's holiday lecture series on stem cells. You may have noticed a common thread running through these lectures. The tools and findings of basic research provide a powerful springboard for medical advancement. Doug Melton's love of developmental biology is leading to better understanding and hopefully new treatments of diabetes. Nadia Rosenthal's commitment to understanding muscle is leading her towards breakthroughs in preventing and treating heart attacks. And discoveries made in mice are being used to translate to strategies for human therapy much more quickly than ever before. In this talk, Nadia will extend our thinking about stem cells and regeneration to include how stem cells may play a role in reversing the project, pro, process of aging and perhaps even extending lifespan. And now a brief video to introduce Nadia. As a child, I really was just a naturalist. And so we spent a lot of time just foraging around and essentially looking into rock pools and having a good time. But I didn't think of myself as a scientist at the time. In fact, my parents are from the theater. So if anything, I was considered a budding artist because I liked to draw. And I think my parents were quite astounded that I might take on something as bizarre for them as a biology career. So in this case, it was the opposite. Why don't you become a sculptor? Why don't you become an artist? And instead I said, no, I want to be a biologist. Okay. No, no, <laughs> let's see, what are we doing? There's something exciting and almost obsessive about being a scientist. There's never an end to the questions you can ask. And I see absolutely no distinction in my students between that bug being caught by men or women. It's absolutely equal. And I am convinced that this is merely a question of teaching women how to be competitive and how to ask for what they need to get their science done. What's really great about having stuck it out this long in science with that initial uh, passion still intact is that our lab is actually now able to answer some limited questions about how organisms form. And I'm absolutely secure that the next generation of scientists, the young students and postdocs in my lab, are going to be the ones who will really be able to unravel that in a way that will satisfy what I was looking for, namely a quantitative way to approach the uh, somehow intangible nature of beauty and pattern and form. And I think that this is the, probably going to be the reason that I want to work on aging research, because I want to stick around long enough to see that happen. Well, buongiorno again. Today we're going to follow some of the themes that we started hearing about in Doug's lecture about degenerative diseases that often affect the aged and how these diseases are, in some cases, uh, diseases that we could model or perhaps even treat with stem cells. Today I'm going to focus on not the diseases that are associated with aging, but the actual aging process itself. So we're all getting old, that's the bad news. Um, and what's worse, if you look on the left at some of the attributes of youth, robust organs, high tissue turnover, wounds healing very rapidly with less inflammation associated with that healing and less scarring, all of those youthful attributes 
are somehow blunted and compromised as we get older. So on the right, the old gentleman, this wonderful drawing of Leonardo da Vinci showing youth and age facing each other, the older man is uh, compromised, frailer organs, lower tissue turnover, wounds healing more slowly. And when they are wounded, older people tend to heal less well so that inflammation sets in and scarring can often compromise the function of the tissues and organs. So the question is, how much can stem cells actually address these natural but rather alarming side effects of getting older? Let's have a look at how stem cells might contribute to different tissue types, because different tissue types actually age at different rates. So if we consider tissues in different categories according to their capacity to turn over at the top, high cell turnover, high regenerative potential, they include blood cells. We've heard a lot about those, gut epithelium and the epidermis. And that's because, we believe, there are abundant stem cells associated with those tissues. Now in the medium category, we see such tissues as liver, which can actually regenerate quite well, and skeletal muscle, less so. But it's better than some of the lower regenerating tissues, such as the brain, the kidney, or the heart, about which we'll hear about later. And in each case, the capacity for regeneration appears to at least roughly track with the contribution of stem cells. So how could it be that stem cells have an effect on aging? Maybe they're just tracking with aging. Is it possible that they actually cause it? If so, there are a few different ways in which we could imagine this could occur. One would be that we simply have less stem cells as we get older. Or perhaps we have the same number, but they're less good at doing what they normally do. Or perhaps the environment in which they find themselves in our aging bodies has shifted so that they're all right, but where they are is not. So let's look at each of these possibilities and see whether there is any truth to them. The first question is whether there are less stem cells as we grow older. And to look at this question, we're going to look at a particular tissue type, which I particularly like to work on, skeletal muscle, which is sort of in the middle of the road. There are stem cells, those tissue cells we talked about yesterday, the satellite cells. But the question is, are there the same number of satellite cells as the muscle ages? Now, I'd have to say one thing about muscle. You all know that we can change the size of our muscle rather voluntarily by going to the gym or by working out in other ways. And in fact, muscle is one of the most marvelously responsive tissues in that sense. And yet, at the same time, as we grow older, no matter how much we work out, no matter how much that master athlete runs, we end up losing up to a third of the muscle mass in our bodies by the time we're 75 or 80 years old. And that really leads to a lot of problems in society. Older people are frailer, they tend to fall, and then their bones are brittle, so they tend to break. And in general, it's an enormous cost to society, but it's also a real problem for quality of life as you grow older. So these aren't just trivial academic questions. These are questions that really could have an effect on society. So let's look at ha what happens when a muscle is injured and regenerates. As you know from my previous lectures, we've talked about these stem cells called satellite cells that sit within the muscle bed. They're normally quiescent, but when the muscle is injured, they're induced to proliferate by activating signals. And this allows them to produce more cells that can then replace the tissue that is damaged or lost, so that repair occurs, and in fact, the muscle is as good as new. So the question then is, does this um, effective replacement during aging um, change? And the answer is, it does. This graph shows the number of satellite cells in fibers in mice that are three to four months old out to 28 to 33 months old. Now for those 